Okay, while this is being said, uh, again, let me thank Wider for the invitation and also for sponsoring part of this, uh, part of the countries that are part of this project. I wanted to say a couple of words. Right now, the coordinators of the project are Chico Ferreira, Murray, Francois, and moi. And, uh, <laughs> and the interesting thing that uh, we are striving to do is to include not just developing countries and middle-income countries, but also the big advanced countries. So far, in addition to the countries that uh, have been presented here, I may forget uh, some of, of course, Brazil with Chico and others, Russia with Lopez Calva and Daria Popova, I don't know where she is. And uh, also we have Indonesia, I don't know if we have. And if I forgot someone, I apologize. And as I was saying the day that I, I gave uh, my little sort of tour of economic thought in uh, Latin American economic thought at the inaugural <coughs> session, uh, wider didn't used to focus so much on it, but maybe when you came, Tony, you're the one who brought it. But I was here in 1985 in a very interesting project coordinated by Lance Taylor and Jerry Heliner, I don't know if he's here, which was on stabilization and adjustment, and we did look at inequality issues. But if you look at the working papers over time, or books, et cetera, of wider, until 99, there are two or three on, on inequality, and since then, there are about 300. So it's, a, it's an interesting trend, and this is part of this trend. Now, uh, first of all, we have been working, when I say we, I mean Luis Felipe, Raimundo, Chico, Francois, working on the inequality in Latin America now for quite some time. And uh, some of you may have seen some of the work. Uh, the, what I'm gonna present today is primarily coming out of the, these three articles. Two are published, one in Andrea Cor Andrea, of course, Andrea, you're another one who's been <laughs> doing a lot of work on inequality in Latin America, in Andrea's book published by, by Wider a paper that we're about to uh, finish, and the new project in which, because we want to focus on top incomes, we have uh, managed to grasp the Latin American in the top incomes group, Facundo Alvaredo. I don't know if he arrived, but he's about to arrive. So what I'm going to be presenting today, I'm going to present part of uh, the results of Mexico, and then Raimundo, I, I thought it was important for him also to be part of the presentation, is going to flesh out what happened in the labor markets. Uh, quickly, uh, it's interesting that Latin America, I mean, when, when Joe Stiglitz talks about inequality in the world, he doesn't want to talk about Latin America because it doesn't fit his story. <laughs> but Latin America has experienced a decline that has been quite systematic and has happened practically in all the countries. And Mexico is one of them. Uh, and so we're gonna focus on Mexico. I'm gonna go really fast because our time allocation was cut in half. <laughs> uh, this is what happened in Mexico. Interestingly, right after NAFTA is when inequality started to decline. We don't know yet how or if it is linked to the process of uh, <coughs> greater integration with the US, but that's, I think, one area we would like to investigate further. But here it shows you an uh, inverted U where inequality was rising from the period of the late 80s to the mid 90s, and then it has been falling. When you look at labor market inequality, it seems to be maybe a reversal in the declining trend. However, when we push the uh, data further, which we're doing now, it's not clear. What we've seen is that it has kind of petered out. The decline has not continued. And so this is a Yitzhaki type of uh, decomposition. And uh, what uh, you see here is the contribution of labor income. This is the first one for each one of those years. This is a problem of Mac PC, not percentage, by the way. So labor income was decreasing inequality, inequality decreasing in the period uh, in, in 2000, 2004, 2006. In the last point, it was inequality increasing. The, uh, even though we don't have the top incomes, we do have income from uh, businesses and rents, etc., on a small scale. Those were all inequality increasing. Transfers 
more inequality reducing and increasing over time in terms of the effect. And the other thing that has been very important in Mexico is remittances as an equalizing factor. So what uh, we have done is that uh, once you start with this, you say, OK, so what's really interesting would be, since we know that this, even though it's inequality increasing, mi is missing what's happening at the top. All the things that I showed you do not have data from the top. Interesting is what happened in the labor markets as a story that explains the decline in inequality. Uh, we have the same analysis as uh, uh, Murray showed for South Africa in terms of applying the commitment to equity framework for, for Mexico. And for Mexico, we, had, we did a little bit over time. And this here shows how the before-after comparison of transfers has been increasing in terms of the decline in inequality. You compare this one with this one, and big time the decline in poverty, right? So transfers have been responsible for what we are observing. But I think that one of the very interesting stories in Mexico with some surprising results is the labor markets, and I'm going to pass it on to Raimundo now. Yeah, thank you, Nora. Um, so, um, so the, uh, the uh, as Nora mentioned, inequality uh, has been going down in Mexico with the slowdown uh, recently. So what uh, we have been doing in uh, our previous papers is try to investigate uh, what is the reason of uh, this uh, decline in inequality uh, in the last uh, 15 years. And well, there are uh, three possible hypotheses that uh, we put uh, down there. Uh, there is an increase in relative supply of skilled workers, or uh, rather maybe since institutions uh, via minimum wages or unionization rates, or maybe about the quality of the education, uh, meaning degraded tertiary for uh, young workers or skills obsolescence for older workers uh, with college education. So we're going to analyze that. So this is a typical graph of uh, supply and demand, uh, uh, like uh, Katz and Murphy and Katz and Goldin. It's the, the, it's the relative returns on the left-hand side and the relative supply on the right-hand side. Um, so it's uh, college over uh, all other workers. Um, and what we see is that in the uh, the relative supply is uh, is not increasing that much before uh, 1994, and then there is a large increase in relative supply of uh, college-educated workers. Uh, and what we want to know is is this related to wages and how is that. Uh, set up, and we observe that the returns decrease at the same time as uh, relative re uh, relative supply increases uh, by a lot. So maybe some, some part or part of the story of the decline in inequality is a large increase in relative supply of college educated workers. Um, uh, we don't, when we contrast with institutions, uh, for example, minimum wage or unionization rates, there is no action. So after 1994, 1996, basically there is no change in the real minimum wage or in unionization rates. So institutions uh, like minimum wage or unionization cannot explain changes uh, in the wage structure uh, during this period. Um, this is a similar graph uh, uh, to the others. Um, uh, here we have the evolution of uh, the log hourly wage by education group. And uh, so what we observe is basically we, we, we normalize everything to uh, all the groups in 2008. So we observe that the decline in returns uh, or in absolute wages for the college-educated workers uh, uh, have, uh, has been declining since 2000, and there is an acceleration uh, basically before 2000, uh, after 2008, after the crisis. And um, the group that has lost the most is uh, the college-educated workers. Uh, so now the next step uh, we have been analyzing is why do college-educated workers uh, show this pattern of uh, declining wages, uh, absolute wages? Um, so we show, uh, we're trying to analyze that, and uh, here we have this table, and this is a very complicated uh, table, and we are short on time. So let me tell you, this is a cohort analysis by uh, year of birth, 
and then we observe uh, over time their wages. And I just want to say basically three message, uh, three messages from here. One is that the oldest workers show the largest uh, declines in wages. It's uh, from 2000 to 2014. It's like 40 percent decline in real wages. Uh, but young workers start with a lower salary. However, their wages do not fall over time. So they are the only ones among all the college educated workers that show an increasing pattern in real wages once they start uh, their, their, their labor lives. Um, so um, basically, this is it the, the, in the final minute. <laughs> Nora will. Yeah, uh, no, I think that uh, so the, 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 to wrap up the message is that labor market was very important. The story has been a decline in the wage premium. Even though educational inequality declined, we have paradox of progress, so it's unequalizing. We can't explain it, but we can do it later. However, you know, we, we started looking at real wages, and we discovered that the wage premium not only fell in terms of relative uh, terms, but also that wages of people with college fell throughout the period. So inequality declined because the top started to lose. And then, you know, we said, oh, is it the new workers? Probably lower quality. University has been expanded quickly. The marginal student is of lower quality. Turns out, no, it's the older workers that are the ones who are losing out the most. So we think there must be a story there. Our conjecture is that there must be a story of a process by which the older workers are being replaced either by technology or by younger workers who are cheaper and know how to use the technology. And when you, when you start asking people anecdotally, it clicks. It actually has been happening. There's a tier of people of college education that have been losing jobs and have to accept way lower wages. Now, so that's a very interesting story. We want to pursue it further. Zero. So. I only wanted to tell you something a little bit about we don't have the top income, so maybe when we add the top incomes, our story changes drastically. And an example, I always give this as a, it's, it's a little bit of a, uh, an extreme example, but collecting data from Merrill Lynch, Forbes, etc., and I calculate you know, a 5% return, which is a return in normal times on the wealth that people say they have uh, on average. Look at the, you know, what the average monthly income would have to be, 600,000 for the millionaires, billionaires, 50 million a month. Carlos Slim, who's Mexican, would be making 100 a million, 150 million a month. And you know, what is it that the two, the two richest households in the Mexican household survey make? 45,000 a month. So we don't have them. And so we have to really get them in. Uh, so finally, for the new project, it's, uh, this one is going to be sponsored by wider, like India and uh, South Africa. Uh, it's going to be Alvaredo Campos and, and Wigan, and we're going to incor try to incorporate the income from capital and top incomes. I think the labor market dynamics has a story that we need to pursue further to see how it's linked also with changes in demand, hopefully. Education, when will the paradox of progress end? And a profile of fiscal redistribution. Thank you.